Well, hello, and welcome back to Accounting 202. I'm your host, Dr. Beat. Today, we're going to be talking about process costing systems. Uh, managerial accounting process costing systems. The last chapter, we talked about job costing systems. Of course, it was on a holiday, so we didn't actually hold class, but we did uh, post the recorded video for that. Hopefully, you all had a chance to watch it. Uh, job cost systems, we talked about how companies receive uh, job orders and the company will then create the product, the, the manufacturer will build the product for the customer based on the individual jobs, individual jobs. That's what the last chapter was about was, was job costing, it was about individual jobs. Today, today we're going to talk about process costing systems. Process costing systems are a little bit different than job costing systems, which is what we learned about in the last chapter. Uh, and here's how I want you to think about this as we go throughout the chapter. In uh, last chapter, we t in the last week, we talked about job costing systems. Job costing systems, again, it's the customer places an order with the manufacturer. The manufacturer then finishes the job. They create the product for the customer for that job. Okay, that's job costing. And process costing, the way I want you to think about this is the manufacturer continually makes the product regardless of the order. Okay, an example of a processor would be like a cereal maker, okay, or uh, uh, an ice cream maker, or um, Apple makes the iPhone. These are continuous, continuous production, okay, continuous. That's what process is. That's what process costing is. We talk about, when we talk about processors, we talk about continuous manufacturing. Okay, continuous. So when we talk about process costing, I want you to think about it like an ice cream manufacturer. They continually make the ice cream. They don't stop and go, stop and go. They continually make the ice cream. They continually make the ice cream, okay? That's a process manufacturer. Uh, yeah, 24-hour processing is a nice way to think about it, Andre. So uh, we, we think about an ice cream manufacturer, they continually making the ice cream because they know they're going to continually be selling it and, and distributing it. That's why, you know, I see millions and millions and millions of units being manufactured and it's continuous. It's 24 hours a day they're making the ice cream. They don't just go, oh, this, this, and then this, and then that's it. No, no, it's continuous. Same with like cereal, uh, meat processing, um, uh, vegetable processing. It's continuous. That's why you go to the grocery store and you're like, oh, they always have produce. Or they always have meat. Or they always have cereal. That's because those are continuous processing manufacturers that are able to make sure that that's always at the store, right? And so as we go through this chapter, I want you to think about it from that perspective. It's a continuous process. Okay, so before we get into the chapter, a couple quick housekeeping notes. Uh, I want to talk about the, the past two weeks. Uh, most of you um, in the class you have uh, been very good about staying on top of your work. Uh, in week in week one, we had the quiz on chapter 15. Week two, we had the homework assignment, chapter 16 through Sengage. This week, chapter uh, week three, we have a quiz on chapter 17. So uh, just as before, as you already know, all of your work is due by the end of the week. Right, so Sunday night 
1159, make sure you complete your quiz for chapter 17. Some of you already went ahead and did that, and that's fantastic, right? So it makes your week nice and easy. But I want you just to make sure that you stay on top of your assignment uh, accordingly. Um, next week, week four, I want to point out this one. This is the chapter 18 discussion board for, for week four. And we'll talk more about that uh, in week four. But I just want you to be aware that a discussion forum is coming up. Uh, we will be approaching a discussion board in week four. So just pre kind of prepare for that. Maybe read ahead a little bit and think about how, what you're going to do for your postings. And I'll talk about the requirements for the discussion board um, at the beginning of next week. So this week we have uh, the chapter for uh, the chapter quiz for the for this chapter, chapter seventeen. Okay, so let's jump into it. Let's start from the beginning. Okay, again, uh, at the mindset you need to have for this chapter is you are a continuous processor. Think of like somebody who makes ice cream or somebody who processes meat or, or vegetables. Think of a grocery store. Think about all the products that the grocery store always has available. The reason why it's always available is because there are companies out there that are continually processing. They're continually manufacturing. An example would be cereal, ice cream, um, you, you name it, right? They're always making it. So get into that mindset. Okay. So think of a process manufacturer will have several different departments that make a finished good. Okay, several different departments that make a finished good. In each de department, the product gets processed further. Okay, so if we think about an ice cream manufacturer, in the very beginning of the process in department A, They'll have the raw materials, okay? They'll have the, the heavy whipping cream. They'll have the ice. They'll have the flavor, right? Uh, so they'll take the raw materials, Department A. They'll transfer it to Department B. In Department B, they'll mix all of that stuff together. Department B is what we'll call the, the mixing department. Okay, and there's costs associated with transferring it from Department A to Department B. Department B is the, the mixing department. And the mixing department will process it further, and they'll send it to Department C. Department C, will say, is the, I don't know, the flavor-adding department. Okay, they, they further process it. So that they've taken the mix all together, from Department B, they transfer it to Department C, which is where they'll add the flavor, okay? And then from Department C, they'll transfer it to Department D, which is the packaging department, okay? And, you know, that's where they put the ice cream in the, in the bin, and then they put the lid on it, yeah? And so that's the process, Department A, raw materials. Department B, mixing. Department C, they add flavor. Department D, their packaging. And you see we move it from one department to another. That's the process. That's the process. And there's costs that get added from each department. Department A, you have raw materials plus a little bit of labor. Department B, you got labor and you got more materials. Department C, you have more materials and more labor. Department D, you have more materials and more labor. But it, it keeps adding, keeps adding. Da, 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 da. Materials, labor, materials, labor, materials, labor. There's probably a little bit of transferring in between. All of these costs add up to the total cost of the product. We'll talk more about that throughout the chapter. Okay, so uh, in the last chapter, we talked about job orders. Job orders uh, are uh, a customer will place an order for a batch of similar products. This example, it's headphones, okay, or speakers, 
the, the customer will place an order to Bose and they'll say, hey, Bose, I want you to make a uh, hundred uh, of these particular headphones and I'm going to sell them at my store. Great. And Bose will make the headphones for them. And another customer will come to them, hey, Bose, I want this particular type of headphones. Great. And they'll have another order from another customer. Hey, Bose, I want you to make these set of speakers. Okay, great. So those are jobs. Customer places an order. They make a specific number of the, of the finished product, right? That's a job. That's not a continuous process. But the, the, the reason I'm showing you these two different slides is I want you to see the difference between a process manufacturer, like an ice cream company that manufactures ice cream, versus a job order manufacturer like Bose. You know, they only make a specific number of speakers or headphones for, uh, based off of customer orders. Okay, here's a nice comparison of, of process manufacturing companies versus job order companies. Process manufacturing companies would include people like Pepsi, Alcoa, Intel, Apple, Hershey's. They continually manufacture their products regardless of job size. The, Pepsi's going to keep making the soda. They're not going to stop. Okay, there's no company out there that's saying, oh, Pepsi, I want this number, I want this number. No, 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 Pepsi don't care. Pepsi going to keep making the soda because they know that they'll could be able to continually manufacture and continually sell their inventory. That's why it's a process manufacturer. It's continuous, just like we talked about before. Same with Alcoa. They make aluminum. Aluminum is always available at the grocery store. You can always get it at the grocery store. It's always there. Why is it always there? Because they continually make it available. Right? Same with Intel computer chips. Since we continually make computers and continually sell them, Intel continually makes their chips for the computers. Apple, the iPhone, it's always available. There's, there, in fact, they keep coming out with new versions of it. Seems like every six, three to six months, they come out with a new one. So because of that, Apple continually makes the iPhone knowing that they'll be able to continually sell them. Of course, it'll change a little bit over time, but it's, it's a process manufacturer, not a job order company. The same could be said for Hershey's. They make chocolate bars. Chocolate bars are always in demand. They're always available at every grocery store. So you'll see that uh, Hershey's there continually making process like 24 hours a day. They have an assembly line of continually making chocolate bars. So those are, all, those are all examples of process manufacturing companies. And the list goes on and on. You can think of uh, Tyson Chicken. They, they continually make uh, chicken or processed chicken. Uh, Tyson, Purdue, um, other meat companies. Uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of vegetable companies. They continually process, uh, a, 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 I guess, more more newer one. Let me think. Um, Beyond Meat, uh, they, they specialize in, in uh, vegetarian uh, uh, style products. There's, there's other uh, more recent ones, but those are process manufacturers. They continually make it. They don't, they don't do it in batches uh, based off of jobs. They just continually do it. So those are examples of process companies. And then you have job order companies. These are companies that make specific products based off of a job. An example of this would be Disney. The Disney company makes movies uh, in addition to, to their theme parks and other streaming bit services. Disney makes movies, and they do that based off, uh, and a movie, as you know, is a job. It's a, it's, it, they make one you know, type of movie, and then they... They produce it, and then they sell it. Uh, Nike, they make athletic shoes, but they do that based off of the job order. So Nike will receive a job order from uh, athletic shoe companies that sell the shoes, right? Uh, like Finish Line or, um, you know, a company like that. They'll come to them and say, hey, Nike, you know, you know I, I need a million 
pairs of athletic shoes and Nike will make a million pairs of athletic shoes. That's a job. Uh, golf course companies, um, log homes, advertising, these are all jobs. They're, they're like one-offs or, the, or they're done in batches. But regardless, there's a finite number. Where, whereas a process manufacturing company, it's an infinite number. It's a way of thinking about it. Everyone's okay so far? You all understand this concept so far? Process company versus job order company. And you're yeah. if, as consumers, like, I'll, if we were to buy a product from Amazon, would that make us, like, um, put up? So if we as consumers order a product from Amazon, would that be considered a job in the eyes of an Amazon worker? Yes. Yep. That's a job. Absolutely. Because it's a one-off type of situation. I mean, it still might be you and a million other people ordering that same product from Amazon, but that's still considered to be a job because it's not, it's, they're not continually making that product to be widely available. They're making it based off of a certain number. Yeah, that would be a job. Good question. In most cases, uh, if it's a, it's a specific product and it's available for a, spe a specific quantity for a specific amount of time, it's going to be a job. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Great. Okay. Uh, so, so there's a couple of similarities between process costing and job costing. They both record and summarize product costs. They both allocate factory overhead to product costs. They both provide useful product cost information for decision making. They both classify products as direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. You, you're going to hear that a lot, right? I, th I think I said that the very first day of, the, of our class together uh, over two weeks ago. I said um, you'll continually hear the three terms direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. Those are, it's, you're always going to hear that. Because in this course, we talk about um, the concept of managerial accounting from a manufacturing perspective. And then both process costing systems and job costing systems will use perpetual inventory for materials work and process and finished goods. Now, we all, uh, hopefully you all know from our earlier conversations and earlier chapters that inventory for th for this course includes raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. And you'll, that'll also come up in future chapters. Okay, so I want to, sh uh, this is one of my favorite slides because it, it shows us a visual perspective of the difference between a process costing system and a job order costing system. Now, I gave an earlier example of an ice cream manufacturer. And this is in the process costing system, we continually make ice cream. We're not going to start and stop and make a certain number for a certain job. We're going to keep making it because we're going to keep selling it, and it's a continuous process. Right? Continuous process. So here's how it works. Our ice cream uh, company, we have a couple of different departments. We have the direct materials where uh, that's department A. You know, we, we have our direct materials. Department B, we have our mixing department. Department C, uh, we have our, our second mixing department. Department D, we have our packaging department. Okay? And so in this... Uh, process, we take the direct materials from Department A and we put them into Department B, which is the mixing department. So we're going to take it out of direct materials and put it into work in process in that, in that same, in that same uh, transfer. So out of direct materials into work in process. When it's in the work in process, it's in the mixing department. That's work in process, right? They're, they're mixing stuff, the, the raw materials up together in a batch to create ice cream. That's the idea. So in the work in process, we, we have direct materials, right? We got it from Department A. We have our direct labor, 
department B, and our factory overhead, departments A and B, right? So we take those three costs, direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead from our mixing department, and then we send it over uh, to the other mixing department. Think of it like parts B and C, right? And then from there, it goes to the packaging department. And when it gets to the packaging department, there's additional direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. Because think of it this way. We have people who are mixing it together, and we have people that are packaging it up. Think of it like, a, like an assembly line. Okay, it's like an assembly line. It goes from raw materials to the mixing department, and then it gets packaged up. Okay? It's, it's, it's individual departments. And it goes from prop, from the beginning to the mixing department to the packaging department, and then it becomes finished good. So uh, we take it from mixing. So what do I mean take it from mixing? We take the direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead that we accumulated in the mixing department. We transfer that to the packaging department, and we add additional direct materials, direct uh, labor, factory overhead, because we have somebody who's packaging the, the ice cream, we have the packaging material, and we have the boxes. And then, of course, the factory, we, we got to have the lights and the conveyor belts and the machines. And so we take all of that and we transfer that to finished goods. By the time it gets to finished goods, we have direct materials from both the mixing department and direct materials from the packaging department. We have direct labor from the mixing department and direct labor from the packaging department. And we have factory overhead from both departments. And that, in total, makes the cost of the finished good. Don't worry, we'll talk a little bit more about it. I just want you to have a nice visual understanding of how it works. So that's process cost system, which is different from job co uh, order cost, which we talked about in the last chapter. In the last chapter, we talked about how direct materials, direct, direct labor, and factory overhead are put on the job cost sheets as the product moves from department to department and becomes a finished good. The reason, it, But you see that it's similar in nature, very similar. They bo both... Job process and job cost include direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead as it moves from department to department to create the cost of the finished good. The primary difference, again, between a process cost system and a job cost system is a process cost is continuous. They're constantly manufacturing the product. Whereas a job order cost system, it's kind of like a one-off or a batch of products. Let's talk a little bit more about the differences between the process and job cost systems. Process cost system, we accumulate the records and work in process for each department. In the job cost system, we, they use job sheets to accumulate the costs. In the job cost system, work in process at the end of the period is the sum of the job sheets. And of course, of partially completed jobs that are in a work in process. In our process cost system, which is what we're focusing on in this chapter, is uh, at the end of the period, the sum of all the costs remaining each department at the end of the period. We're gonna, uh, uh, so in other words, uh, as it goes through the process, from department to department to department to department, at the end of the accounting period, we total up the product cost that's in each department, which is different than taking the job order cost, uh, uh, cost sheets, because the job order cost sheet shows the totals for uh, each job. But in process order costing, we take the 
total of the product costs in each department and total it up at the end of the accounting period. It's a little bit different because the, the reason for that is because in job order costs, we're, we're doing it for jobs. We're not doing it in a continuous process. So this is the physical flow of our ice cream company. We have our raw materials, our dairy, our milk, cream, sugar, um, syrups, whatever. We take it out of our raw materials. It goes to our mixing department. Our mixing department processes, hence the word process costing, our mixing department processes the raw materials together to create the ice cream. We send it from the mixing department to the packaging department where it gets processed further. We process it by putting the, raw, the ice cream into the, the containers. And we put the lid on the container and then we put a batch of uh, a batch of uh, finished ice cream into the boxes. And then we move it from the packaging department into finished goods. We put it in the freezer until we load it up on a truck to be sent to the, to the grocery store. Does it make sense so far? Yeah, it makes sense. Great. Wonderful. Yes, that makes sense. Awesome. Thank you so much. Just got to make sure, you know. <laughs> it Just like everything else in accounting that we talk about, it's it's all really you know, step by step. So think of step by step. Starts in raw materials and it goes to the mixing department, packaging department, finished goods, step by step, step by step. So, uh, so now that you see it from a physical flow of materials, let's talk about it from an accounting perspective. Oh, yay. All right. <laughs> okay. So, as you know, it starts in raw materials. In raw materials, we send our raw materials to our work in process, which is our mixing department. So, you see the transfer. We... Uh, raw material starts with a debit to purchases and a credit to our inventory, right? Then we uh, debit the direct materials to get it out of our raw materials to our work in process. Once it's in work in process, we add direct materials and factory overhead. Why do we do that? Well, in the mixing department, we have our raw materials. But then, of course, we need somebody to put the raw materials together, so we got direct labor. And then, of course, we already know we're going to be using some machines for this process, right? So we got factory overhead. Okay, so we got, in our mixing department, we got direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. Then, uh, once we mix our batches of ice cream together, we need to then send it from the mixing bowls to the packaging department, right? And so there's going to be a cost associated with getting it from the mixing department to the packaging department, whether that be by a conveyor belt or, or by... Um, you know, a pallet, you're moving it from one department to another. So what, somehow you got to get it there. And so there's a cost associated with that. And you got to add that cost in. That's the cost of units transferred out. So you, you add up direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. You transfer it out of that department. And you put it into the work and process package, which is the uh, packaging department. That's the next department within work and process. And then, of course, there we have our materials that we got from the mixing department, plus the cost of transferring it to that department. Then we got to add some more direct labor because somebody's got to package it up. And then we have additional factory overhead. And then, of course, you know, then, then you got the cost of the packaging materials, all that fun stuff. You add all that together, you package it up the ice cream. And then we got to send it off to the freezer. So you, you've, you've 
cost of goods transferred out, uh, cost of units transferred out. That includes the cost of putting it on pallets and bringing the pallets into the freezer, at, which is where the that's where finished goods. It's finished. It's in the freezer, and it's waiting to be sold to the customer. And that process co continues over and over and over again. And it's continuous. There's always going to be raw materials. There's always going to be work in process mixing department. There's always going to be work in process packaging department. And then, of course, there's always going to be product sitting in the freezer. And then eventually we'll sell it and it becomes cost of goods sold. Any questions on this? Does it make sense? Remember, think about the logical flow of of making ice cream, raw materials, to the mixing bowl, to the packaging, and then to the freezer, and then you sell it. And you do that over and over again. And it's and it's continuous. You're always doing it. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Does it make sense? Any questions so far? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Cool. Great. Great, great, great. Yeah, like I said, once you understand the the steps and you understand the logical flow of it, it's just a matter of thinking about, okay, so what are the costs associated with doing that? You know, you got your raw materials cost, and then you, we add, if we take it out of raw materials, put in work in processing, you add in some direct labor and some factory overhead. Then we're going to move it to the next department. I take all of those costs plus the cost of moving it over. And I add some more direct materials, direct labor factory overhead. And I move all of those costs over to the finished goods. And then eventually to, to the cost of goods sold when I sell it. It's a nice, simple flow. Okay, so let's talk about the actual costs. So you, that was a nice visual representation of the cost. We know there's direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. We know that. We know there's also costs of transferring it in and out of each department. Well, let's talk more about how, how it looks, how all those costs look, and how they're reported. Because remember, we're talking about managerial accounting in this course. In managerial accounting, we're talking about how managers use the cost information in a report to better make decisions, right? And so uh, let's talk about the cost of production report. In process costing system, the units of uh, transferred out of each processing department must be determined along with the cost of any partially completed units remaining in that department. We call these uh, the report that summarizes these are called the cost of production report. So I said earlier that uh, at the end of each accounting period, we total up the amount of uh, product, if you will, in each department. We, we get a, So at the end of the month, we get a total of what is in our direct materials. At the end of each month, we get a total of what is still in our mixing bowl, okay, our mixing department. We also get a total of what is in our packaging department. And then we get a total of what is in our finished goods. Because remember, in a continuous process, you're always going to have some amount of material in each department. Okay, so like I'm not going to shut the line down at the end of each month just to total everything up. That's that's silly. But I'm, what I am going to do is I'm going to take um, uh, a production report and summarize what is in each department at the end of each month. But I'm not going to do that by shutting the line down and then counting and then starting it back up. That would cost me a ton of money. So I do it continuously and I just... You know, total everything up at the end of each month as it's, as it's being processed. So the cost of production report summarizes the production and the cost data for each department. Here's how it looks. We take the uh, units the department is accountable for and the disposition of those units, meaning the transfer of those units. 
the product costs incurred by the department and the allocation of those costs between completed and partially completed units. Okay, so this part gets a little bit tricky, but I'll, I'll try to break it down for you like this. So we have our finished goods. Those are our full um, containers of ice cream, yeah? Our, what, do, what do you call a, a pint or a, a gallon, whatever. But a finished good, it's it's finished. The, the lid's on it, it's ready to be sold, okay? That's a full unit. That's a full unit. You might also have, and you will also have, partially completed units. Those are the units that are still in the work and process stage. You're going to have uh, containers that, that still need to put have the lid put on them in the packaging department. You're going to have containers that uh, haven't been filled yet because they're waiting on the ice cream in the mixing department. But you still need to account for the ice cream that's in the mixing department. Those are partially completed units. And we'll talk more about that. Okay, so let's talk about um, the production report a little bit more. So if the first step, first step to the process, to cost of production report, first step, is we determine the units to be assigned costs. Determine the units to be assigned costs. So how do we do that? We look at the number of projected units in each department at the end of the month. So uh, I go to my raw materials. Oh, I think I have this number of units. I, my mixing department. Oh, I think I could get this number of units out of that batch that's in the mixing bowl. I go to my packaging department. Oh, I think I'm going to finish this number of units by the end of the month. And then our finished goods, we, we can count the number of units there. It's pretty easy because we just go in the freezer and count them up. But number one, we determine the number of units to be assigned cost. Number two, step two, we compute the equivalent units of production. Equivalent units of production. Okay. It sounds a little tricky. It is, but we'll talk more about how to compute it. But just think of it this way. If I have uh, X number of units that I think are in the mixing department, and I know how much a finished um, gallon of ice cream costs, I can then compute the equivalent units of production based off of the number of units I think I can produce in the, in the work in process. We'll talk more about that. Step three is determine the cost per equivalent unit. We'll talk more about that as well. And step four is to allocate costs to units transferred, uh, transferred out and to part and to partially completed units. And what that is, is think of it this way. We have our raw materials. And we have our work in process. Within a work in process, we have our mixing department and our packaging department. It's going to cost something to be able to transfer the materials the, from the mixing department to the packaging department, and then again from the packaging department to the finished goods. That's the cost of transferred in and out. We're going to talk more about that. Okay, so to prepare the cost of production report, we have to make some what we call cost flow assumptions. And that is based off of the cost of inventory. And you may possibly have learned a little bit about this in 201. And you probably don't remember it. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and you may have already come across this in your book. But let's talk about the cost of inventory. There are a few different methods that we use to apply a cost to inventory. We have what's called the first in, first out method. We also have the last in, first out method. And we also have the average cost method. 
The first in, first out method is the most commonly used uh, in process costing. The reason why is because the, the types of products that are manufactured using continuous process costing are typically products that expire. Like ice cream, for example. You go to the grocery store and you realize that the ones in the front of you, the ones closest to you, are the ones that expire the soonest, right? You, f you see that a lot at the grocery store. You go, go to the grocery store and you go, oh, this, this gallon of ice cream expires at the end of this month. The one behind it expires a week later, or the batch behind it expires a week later. The, that's called first in, first out. It was the first batch to arrive to the grocery store, and it's the first batch to leave the grocery store. Make sense? First in, first out. Have, have you covered this in 201, just out of curiosity, or do you remember this from 201? Yeah, uh, we, we covered it. I did. Uh, this what I thought. Yeah, I thought we did. I think it was in a later chapter, but I do remember talking about it in, in 201. And I also had to explain this to my daughter when we went to the grocery store. Because, <laughs> and and <laughs> some of the produce looked very like it was about to um, wither. And I was telling her to reach further in the back instead of the closest in the front. And, yeah, I had to explain this to her at the store. Nice, Angela. Yeah, I, yeah, that's, that's a great way of teaching it, too. And, um, yeah, that's fantastic. Very, very cool. Okay, so good. I'm glad that I'm glad that most of you remember this from 201. And now I now that you mentioned it, yes, sir. Now I remember. I think we covered it. Um, I think it was toward the middle, maybe closer to the end of uh, in, in 201. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, and so and so, as you would expect, with a continuous uh, with in processing, as a process manufacturer, we're continually making it. So. As it go, as it leaves the the company, uh, it's we use first in, first out as a, as the costing. That makes the most sense. Okay, so let's look at it from this example. Uh, so for our ice cream department, the name of our ice cream department is Frozen Delight. Isn't that a cute name? That's a cute name. Okay, so. The cost of production report for our company, Frozen Delight, for the mixing department. Now, remember, the mixing department, they're the ones that take the raw materials, the, 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 um, the milk, the cream, the sugar, all of those good things to make the ice cream, okay, they, and the ice. They take all that great stuff out of, the, out of the raw materials. We put it in the mixing department. Mixing department, they're going to make the ice cream, okay? They're making the ice cream making the ice cream you know you know how you make ice cream so uh here's our report for the month of july this is a this is our production report the report i was talking about earlier okay so here's how it looks we have our inventory in process that's what we got in our mixing department right now okay for uh, at the beginning of july beginning of, on july 1 we have direct materials, 5,000 gallons, okay? We got conversion costs for 5,000 gallons. Conversion costs are the costs to convert it, right? We talked about conversion costs, I believe, a, a little bit in uh, the last chapter. And I want to say, maybe in the first, in chapter 15 as well. Uh, conversion costs, as you know, include direct labor and and uh, it also includes um, direct, direct labor and overhead factory overhead so direct labor and factory overhead are conversion costs the reason why they're conversion costs is because we use labor and factory overhead to convert it from its current state into a work in process yeah, and so there's costs associated with that. So in this case, we are 70% complete 
converting our initial 5,000 gallons. So that is $1,225. How did we get that amount, you might ask? Well, the direct materials cost for 5,000 gallons was $5,000. That's a dollar per gallon, right? And the conversion costs we said are were 70% complete of our 5,000 gallons. So 70%, 5,000, 1,225. That gives us a total beginning inventory, July 1, $6,225. Then we brought in an additional 60,000 gallons from our, our, our raw materials. So we brought in an additional 60,000 gallons during the month of July. So now we have, uh, and, and the cost of that 60,000 gallons brought in $66,000. The total cost of labor for the month of July for the mixing department is $10,000. I don't know what their hourly wages. It doesn't tell us. Our factory overhead for the month of July, we said is $7,275. How they got that amount, they probably figure out the cost of the electric bill for, for that department. They probably figured out a little bit of allocation of uh, office, uh, supervisor, whatever, whatever. Right? That factory overhead, you know how that works. To get us a total production cost of ninety thousand, how did we get ninety thousand? Uh, let's see. We got um, we got our direct materials, our direct labor, factory overhead, and of course our beginning inventory. Okay, so total production cost ninety thousand. Here's the question. Question is the gallons transferred to the packaging department. In the month of July is 62,000 gallons. Okay. How much did that cost? Any guesses? Any thoughts? Gallons transferred to the packaging department in July, 62,000 gallons. This includes the units that were processed on July 1st. How much did that cost? Any ideas? I'm sorry, Professor. What was your question? Yeah, I wanted, wanted to find out um, any guesses on the transfer cost of 62,000 gallons to the packaging department. What do you think the transfer cost was? Would it be the difference between product production cost and inventory process? Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. We got the right idea. So that's Swag. what I was looking for. Go ahead, Andre. No, I, I was just surprised that that was, the, you know, pretty good. Yeah, no, it's very good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then, Can you repeat what he said? What you say, Andre, again? Um, I was saying in order to get the gallons transferred to packaging in July, you would take the difference between pro the production cost and inventory process. Uh, which is okay. thousand and six thousand twenty six thousand two hundred twenty five. Right, exactly. Yep. And and uh, and then the, the second question is inventory and process is at the end of the month was three thousand gallons with twenty five percent conversion costs. So to get that, you would take the twenty five percent times the three thousand gallons. Uh, I'll say that again. So, so for the inventory and process, at the end of the month, we said we ended with, for that month, what's remaining in inventory for the mixing department is 3,000 gallons. And we have a conversion cost of 25%. So what that means is we take the 3,000 gallons times the 25% to get that dollar amount. So by preparing the cost of production report, the cost of gallons transferred to the packaging department in the month of July, and the ending working process inventory are determined. 
So the nice thing with this report is it basically tells me uh, what I have started with an inventory for, for the mixing department, how much I processed during the month, and how much I ended with in that department. And it also t tells me about the conversion costs of getting it into the department and out of the department. That's the nice thing about these types of reports. And you you create the same type of report for the packaging department as well. So what about how do we assign the costs? How do we assign the costs? Okay, it's it's a couple of steps. Okay, how do we assign costs? The first step of assigning costs is to determine the units to be assigned costs. Well, when you hear the word unit, it's a unit of measure. Uh, tons, gallons, pounds, barrels, cases. These are all units of measure. For ice cream, we talk about ice cream in terms of gallons. In terms of gallons. So we're going to use gallon as our unit of measure. So step one, what's the unit of measure? Step one, what's the unit of measure? And for ice cream, it's gallons. So look at it from an example. In our mixing department, we are, are accountable for 65,000 gallons of direct materials used during the month of July. So 65,000 gallons. July 1, I started with 5,000. And I took an additional 60,000 out of raw materials into my mixing department for the month of July. So that's accountable for a total of 65,000. Remember, Beginning inventory plus uh, any purchases, in this case, which it, it's transfer from raw materials. So beginning inventory plus transfer raw materials equals uh, units accounted for. Beginning inventory or beginning in process plus materials transferred from uh, storage or raw materials equals units accounted for. In this case, 65,000. So I'm accountable for 65,000 units. I'm using gallons as my measure of, of, of uh, my unit of measure. So for the month of July, this the next step or it's, I guess we're in the, still in the first step to determine the cost, right? For the month of July, what I need to do is uh, figure it out for three groups, okay, three groups. Group one, I take units of measure beginning work and process inventory on July 1. I think we said it was 5,000. Second group, group started and completed during the month of July, 65,000. Group three, I figure out the ending work and process at the end of July, which we don't know yet. Well, actually, it says, uh, okay, ending is 3,000. So group one, group two, group three. Beginning balance, 5,000. That's group one. Uh, look, looks like in this part of the example, I transferred in, I think I transferred in 60,000. I complete. I started and completed 57,000, which means I ended with three. So if I, tra yeah, okay, that makes sense. I began with 5,000. I transferred in 60. I, yeah, I began with 5,000. I transferred in 60. During the month of July, I processed 57, which means I ended with 3,000. Make sense? Took me a little bit. <laughs> so that's 65,000 total gallons to be assigned. Beginning, we began with 5,000. And then we process 60 during the month of July. 
So is that like cost of goods sold similar to this cost of goods it's sold? It's similar. It's similar. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely similar to cost of goods sold. But uh, but since we're talking about process manufacturing, there's additional cost associated with that cost of goods sold. And so we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. And it's the cost of transferring in and out of each department. That's the, the additional cost. Additional cost of goods sold. And so let's talk about that. Uh, group one, we got 5,000 um, gallons of ice cream. That was our beginning inventory. We started to complete 57,000 gallons. It's because we transferred in 60,000 originally. We, we started with five, that's 65. We transferred out 62,000 gallons of ice cream to the packaging department from the uh, mixing department. Which means that we have a, a ending inventory in the mixing in the mixing department of three thousand gallons, and that's how we get to the total units to be assigned cost, which is sixty five thousand gallons. So all of that is step one. Step two is we need to compute the equivalent units of production. So earlier I said that. Um, a unit of production that's complete is a full gallon of ice cream. Okay, that's in our sitting on our finished goods. We got a full gallon of ice cream that's a complete unit. An incomplete unit is it's sitting in the packaging department waiting for a lid. It's in the mixing department. It's still in the mixing bowl. Those are incomplete units. So how do we compute equivalent units? How do we compute equivalent units of production? We use a portion of the completed whole units based on the materials or conversion costs. And we're going to talk more about that. And the best way I could show you is, of course, through an example. So let's assume that our company has a... Uh, that a thousand gallon batch, we call it a vat, that's a unit of measure, a vat of ice cream at our company is 40% complete in the mixing process at the end of May. So if the mixing process were only 40% complete in the mixing process at the end of May, the batch is only 40% complete as the cost, the conversion cost, such as power. Okay. So here's how it works. I got to figure out what is my conversion cost based off of the units of production. So I said I have a thousand gallon batch. That it means that I have a thousand units. Material cost, thousand units. Equivalent units in gallons is a thousand, a thousand uh, gallons, which is a thousand units, which is one vat. The whole units in gallons is a thousand, a thousand units. I said that we're 40% complete in the mixing process. So that means I have 400 gallons that are complete. How do we get 400 gallons, you might be asking? We took 1,000 units times 40%. 1,000 times 40% is 400 gallons. The 400 gallons is my equivalent units of production. For materials and conversion process, we determine these two things separately. Conversion costs are determined separately from the units of materials because there are things like um, electricity, overhead, uh, well, you know, conversion costs include direct labor and factory overhead. 
And because conversion costs include direct labor and factory overhead, we need to figure out what the rate is for the conversion costs. And that's, of course, going to be different from, from the units of materials. So let's look at it from again from our example. <clears throat> so to compute equivalent units for materials, we need to know how the materials are added during the manufacturing process. <clears throat> so remember, we got group one, group two, group three. Group one, beginning uh, working process, the beginning process, right? We said it was 5,000 units. Group two, that's the amount of materials I moved in from our raw materials, 57,000 units. We transferred out 62,000 units to the packaging department. Uh, group three, we still had 3,000 gallons at the end of the month. So what do we do? We apply, uh, we have to figure out what the rates are. The beginning rate for the beginning process is 0% because we started with it. We didn't, there was no processing with the beginning working process. 57,000, group two, we applied 100%. Why 100%? Because we started to complete 57,000 units. That's 100%. 57,000 units. We, tr we transferred out 62,000 units. So that what does that mean? We transferred out all of our beginning work in process. Beginning, I'm, I'm sorry, our beginning, yeah, our beginning work in process. And on that additional 60, that 57,000 units. So that's 62,000. So we transferred all out. And then we start the whole process again. At the end of the month, 3,000 units becomes the 10%. Total gallons to be assigned, 65,000. The units for direct materials is 60,000. Reason for the difference is because of the beginning inventory. Here's a better graphical representation of that. Beginning inventory, 5,000 units. It's 100% of the materials for the month of June, so we didn't have any materials equivalent. Then we started the month. We brought in an additional 57,000 units. We ended the month with 3,000 units. That means we're accountable for 60,000 units, technically 65 but we got 60,000 units of materials cost for the month. We don't count the materials cost that we started with. We only count the materials cost for the materials that we used during that month. Does it make sense? Kind of, sort of? I know this part gets a little confusing. You're all still awake? Yeah, it makes sense for me. Great. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. You're all still good? Okay. I'm here, Professor. I'm just uh, computing everything and letting us <laughs> simmer in. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I, I totally get it. It, it takes a little bit of time to process the information. Yeah. Great. I'm still drinking coffee. Can you believe it? Okay, where am I? Oh, I'm sorry. I went too fast. My apologies. We talked about that one. We talked about that one. Okay, step five. Or the, the last part of step two. Uh, okay. So we started the uh, beginning of the month with the 5,000 units. Of those 5,000 units, 70% of those units were completed. That gives us a uh, conversion, percent conversion completed in the month of July of 30%.
how was did we get figure out it was 30 percent you might be asking uh that's the difference 70 percent was completed what's left 30 percent so to compute equivalent units for the conversion costs necessarily to know how much direct labor and factory overhead enter the manufacturing process as we know factory overhead includes things like utilities equipment depreciation um, part of the supervisor's salary those are standard uh, factory overhead costs right and of course you have your direct labor direct labor the folks that are making the product on the assembly line so uh, we assume that the, our company incurs conversion costs evenly throughout the manufacturing process. It's not always even in the real world scenario, but to make things a little easier, we'll say it's even. Here's how it works. Group one, we got our beginning inventory, 5,000 units. We completed 70% of that, which means that our percent conversion completed for the month of July is 30%. Again, how do you get 30%? It's the difference. We, we said we completed 70%, so 30% must be remaining, right? Group two, that's our the amount that we brought in and completed, 57,000 gallons. That's 100%. It's 100%. Why? Because we used 100% of it in the process. We ended the month of July with 3,000 units. Uh, of that 3,000 units, 25% of those were completed, which means our present conversion for, completed for the month of July is 25%. <clears throat> now, uh, on the far right, you see the equivalent units for conversion. How do we come up with these figures, you might ask? Well, it, it works like this. We take the uh, whole units, we multiply that by the percent conversion completed for the month. That's how we get those, those uh, figures. So 5,000 times 30%, 1,500. 100%, uh, 57,000 is 57,000. We add group one and group two together because we're transferring those to the packaging department month of July. Our ending inventory, we said, was 3,000 gallons. 25% of that 3,000 has been completed. 3,000 times 25%, 750. We add that to our transferred uh, packaging to the packaging department in the month of July. Our total gallons to be assigned cost is 59,250 gallons. Oof, it's a lot. This part always gets a little uh, confusing for, for most students. That's why I try to go slow and try to explain it. We started the month, 5,000 units. We, uh, of that 5,000 units, we were able to complete 70% uh, in the month of June, which left us 30,000 units that we completed in the month of July. All 5,000 units were uh, consumed in the month of July. Uh, also in the month of July, we transferred in and utilized 57,000 units. At the end of the month of July, we were left with 3,000 units. Of that 3,000 units, we were able to complete 25%. So that's why we see here in the middle, we were able to Complete and use for the month of July, 30% from the beginning inventory, 100% of everything we brought in, and 25% of all that was left over, leaving us 59,250 uh, gallons, total equivalent units for conversion for the cost in July. Oof, that's a lot. <clears throat> it's getting dry. Okay. A little bit more coffee. All right. So step three. Oh, I know. These are long steps, aren't they? Step three. Determine the cost 
per equivalent unit. Formulas, yay! <laughs> I know, right? Okay, the cost per equivalent unit for the direct materials and conversion costs. Here's how they're computed. Direct materials cost per equivalent unit. We take the total direct materials cost for the period divided by the total equivalent units of direct materials. Don't worry, a lot of times these figures will be given to you. That's the direct materials cost per equivalent unit. Co conversion cost per equivalent unit. Take the total conversion cost for the period divided by the total equivalent units of conversion costs. Okay. Now, of course, you know we got to have some examples. Month of July. Direct materials conversion costs. Here's how it works. <clears throat> Started with uh, inventory process. <clears throat> Remember how it was 100%, so it starts at zero for direct materials. <clears throat> conversion costs, or I'm sorry, conversion gallons, uh, we said for the beginning of July was 1,500. Now you're saying, oh, Dr. B, we started with, with, uh, well, no, we started, we, we started with, no, we started. We didn't start with zero, right? We started with um, thirty-five hundred. Started with thirty-five hundred, Doctor B. I know, but in the month of July, we converted or completed thirty percent, which is fifteen hundred. So we can converted or completed fifteen hundred units for the for that beginning batch. Then we said we brought in. And completed 57,000 gallons. So that's conversion, 57,000. We transferred to the packaging department, 57,000 gallons. Well, actually, we transferred more than that because, remember, we uh, in Group 1, we completed, converted, 30%, which is 1,500. So 1,500 plus 57,000 is 58,500. So 58,500 gallons of ice cream transferred to the packaging department in the month of July. We also converted or completed ending the ending balance of the 3,000. We, we said it was, uh, what was it, 30%? 25%, sorry. We uh, completed 25% of the ending balance. So 25% of 3,750. We also transferred that to the packaging department eventually. Uh, so we, but we have to assign total gallons to be. Uh, to, we have to assign the cost to 59,250 gallons. Now, what about the conversion costs? Here's the fun part. So direct materials, we said it was $66,000. Uh, why 66,000? Uh, it's, uh, it's the amount that we process, right, for the month of July. $66,000. Conversion cost, we had direct labor, 10500 We had factory overhead, 7275 We just add those two together to get 17775 leaving us a total product cost for the month of July. 83,775. How we got there? You had direct materials plus your conversion costs. Direct labor factory over. Gets you to 83,775. Okay. A couple of uh, easy formulas. Here's a good one. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about these earlier. The direct materials cost for a equivalent unit. Take your total direct materials cost for the period divided by total equivalent units of direct materials. $66,000 divided by 60,000 gallons. How do we get these figures? $66,000 was the cost of direct materials. 60,000 gallons was the direct materials that needed to be assigned costs. But that was 60,000 gallons is what we essentially utilized for the month of July. 
So $66,000 of direct materials divided by 60,000 gallons utilized for the month of July, uh, month of July equals $1.10 per gallon. $1.10 per gallon. That is the direct materials cost per unit. $1.10. Then we have the conversion cost. As you know, conversion costs include the direct uh, labor and the factory overhead. Uh, so we take the direct labor factory overhead, uh, which is $17,775 for the month, divided by 59,250 gallons. I can hear you now. Dr. B, why isn't that 60,000? The reason why it's not 60,000 is because, remember, we have direct materials and then we have converted materials. Converted materials, also known as conversion materials. We can convert it, uh, the, 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 um, what was it, 30% in the beginning of the month, plus 100%, 57,000, plus 25% uh, at the end of the month. You add all those guys, to get all, all those, all those conver conversion units together to get to 59,250. So conversion cost per equivalent unit, you take your total conversion cost for the period, that's your direct uh, labor and your factory overhead, 17,775 for the month, divided by your conversion units, 59,250, equals 30 cents per gallon. You're all still with me? Any question so far? We're almost there. No. Yeah, no questions. All right. Great. Thank you. Step four. This one's a little bit longer, but we're almost there. We have to allocate costs to transferred units out in partially completed units. Product costs must be allocated to the units transferred out and the partially completed units on hand at the end of the period. Remember how I said that we have units that will still be in the mixing bowl and raw materials, in the packaging department, and in the freezer. So at the end of the accounting period, we have to uh, allocate the cost of the units that have been transferred out of each department and units that have been co uh, partially completed. Okay. So, uh, going back to the example, total production costs to be assigned for our company in the month of July are 90000 How do we get 90000 We started the month 5,000 gallons. 70% completed, that's 1,225. 5,000 plus the convert. So, your direct materials costs plus your conversion costs equals total inventory at the beginning of the month. Direct materials cost plus conversion cost equals total inventory beginning of the month. Plus direct materials used for the month. Plus direct labor for the month. Plus factory overhead applied for the month. Equals Total costs incurred for the month. Okay. So we take our total costs incurred for the month plus our beginning inventory gets us to our total production costs. Make sense? Pretty easy, right? Straightforward. Units to be assigned cost, uh, the cost to be assigned to these units are indicated by question marks. Do we have a question mark? I'm sure we do, right? Yeah, there they are. Okay. Group one, 5,000 uh, units. What's the total cost? Group two, 
started them, uh, completed 57,000 units. What's the, what's the total cost? Then we have what total cost, total cost. We know what the total costs are because we already talked about them. So 5,000, 5,000, 57,000 uh, gallons. What is that? 60, 60, yeah, six, 66. Yeah, 57,000 gallons plus that three, right? 60,000 gallons, $66,000. So forth and so on. You can always work backward too. All right. 5,000 gallons of inventory and process and group one were completed and transferred out of the packaging department in July. Cost of these units are the following. Beginning, there's no there's no direct material cost and there's no conversion cost for beginning inventory. Because I mean those those direct materials and conversion costs happen during the process, not at the beginning of the process. Equivalent units at the beginning of the month is 1500. Zero times a dollar ten is zero. Fifteen hundred. Times thirty cents is four fifty. So four fifty were our conversion costs for the beginning uh, beginning process inventory. So you have your beginning uh, raw materials six six thousand two twenty five plus your conversion cost of the raw materials four fifty equals your total uh, materials transferred to the, to the packaging department six thousand six seventy five. So we see uh, that we take the uh, total gallons that we started the, mo the month or during the month, I'm, I'm sorry, total gallons during the month, and we take our conversion per unit, we multiply that by the gallons that we started and completed during the month to get our total cost, uh, our total cost for the month. So 62,700 were our total costs of direct materials. 17,100 was our conversion cost for the month. So you add together your direct materials plus your conversion costs to get total cost for the month of 79,800. July 1, we have initial costs in the inventory 6,675. Our total cost for the month of July, 79800 gets us to a total cost transferred to the packaging department in the month of July, 86475 3,000 gallons were in process at the end of the month of July. We said that 25% were converted in the month of July. So that tells us there's 750 gallons that were converted. Uh, the conversion cost, as you know, is $0.30 cents per gallon. That's $225 of conversion cost. 3,000 gallons times co cost per unit is $1.10. That's 3,300 plus the $225 of conversion cost, giving us uh, ending in process inventory of $3,525. So again, when, every time you hear the word conversion cost, you got to think that you're taking your materials cost and you're adding in the cost of converting those materials. That's the way you, I want you to think about this process. You take your, your materials cost and you're adding in the cost of converting those materials. That would, be again, be your direct labor and your factory owner. So to summarize, uh, group one, that's your beginning balance. We started whole units, 5,000. The total cost of those 5,000 units, including all the conversion costs, was 6,675. So again, that's materials plus conversion costs. Group two, we, we started and completed 57,000 gallons. Uh, the gallons cost $66,000. That was the, our materials cost, remember? plus our conversion costs 
for those 66, uh, for the 57,000 gallons. So 66,000 for the materials plus uh, the 30 cents per gallon of conversion cost gets us to 79,800. Total transfer to the packaging department would take the 79,800 plus the beginning uh, that we completed in the month of July, 86,475. We were able to process 25% of the 3,000 gallons. Uh, 3,000 gallons plus the conversion cost, 225, uh, or I'm sorry, 525, got us to 3,525. You add that to the uh, packaging department to get the total cost for the month of July, 90,000. <clears> so what does the report tell us? What does the uh, cost production report tell us? It tells us the units for which the department is accountable for and the disposition of those units. Also tells us the production of units incurred by the department and the allocation of those costs between transferred in and out of and partially completed units for the department. Here's how it looks. This is a nice visual representation of, of, the, of the process, okay? Your whole units are in column B we started with 5,000. We received 60,000 from our materials, getting us to 65,000. That was the first step. Second step is we assigned our costs, right? Uh, 5,000 for, for the uh, beginning inventory. We had our conversion costs of, of the 5,000, which was 1,500. Why 1,500? That's 70% of 5,000. Then we started and completed 57,000 gallons for the month of July. It's just 57,000 across. We transferred to the packaging department 62,000 gallons, whole units. But it wasn't quite that because, as you recall, there were 3,000 units left at the end. So we converted using the uh, uh, equivalent units. 57,000, or I'm sorry, 62,000, we uh, had uh, the conversion cost, which was uh, 30 cents per, uh, per gallon. That's 58,500. 58,500. Uh, we were left with 3,000 gallons of whole units. We, we, we completed 25% of that, which was 750 leaving us total units to be assigned cost 59250 So that was the, that, that second step, right? Then step three were the cost per, we had to figure out the cost per equivalent unit. 66000 was our uh, materials cost for the month of July, divided by 60,000 gallons was a dollar and 10 cents per gallon. The conversion cost for that, the conversion costs were 17,775 for the month of July. We got that from direct material, I'm sorry, direct labor and factory overhead, divided by the conversion gallons, 59,250, gets us to 30 cents per gallon of equivalent unit, cost per equivalent unit. Uh, step four was we assigned we assigned cost to, to production. Our inventory at the beginning was 6,225. Cost incurred during the month was 83,775, getting us to a total cost for the mixing department for the month of 90,000. Then step five, we allocated uh, to completed and partially completed units. So, yeah, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Any questions? I know it's a little boring. It's not as fun as the other chapters. You're all good. Okay. Drill on Aries. We're almost done.
the journal entries. Journal entries for the company uh, are shown in the next few slides. As you know, uh, at the end of each month, we have adjusting journal entries. We talked about that in Accounting 201. We talked about adjusting journal entries. It's part of the accounting cycle. Uh, adjusting journal entries, it works the same way uh, when we transfer um, and then for it, when we transfer product from one department to another, we have to have journal entries for it. So, and we record it daily, record it usually in adjusting entries. Okay. So the, here are the journal entries. We purchased uh, raw materials, milk, cream, sugar, pack, uh, packaging materials, and indirect materials on account for 88000 we debit our materials inventory, 88000 And we credit accounts payable, 88000 Debit materials, credit accounts payable, because we bought raw materials on account. Okay, <clears throat> second transaction. The mixing department uh, requested milk, cream, and sugar from our raw materials department of $66,000 worth. Packaging materials was 8,000 requested by the packaging department. Okay, so from my raw materials, I transferred $66,000 to our mixing department and $8,000 from raw materials to our packaging department. So 66,000 to mixing, 8,000 to packaging. And of course, there were in, there's some indirect materials involved as well. Remember, indirect materials, those are the smaller components. They don't make up the majority of the cost. So in this example, like, like the, uh, the syrup, okay, for, for the mixing, that doesn't make up most of the cost. So it's a smaller amount. Uh, for packaging, it would be like the bubble wrap. You know, it, it doesn't make up a whole big amount. So that would be a small amount for for that. Those those are indirect materials. For the packaging uh, departments was 4125 and 3000 respectively. So total materials uh, requisitioned were 81125 So it would be very easy to figure out how much was left in our raw materials, 88000 minus 81125 And that, that would be what's left in our uh, raw materials at the end of the month. During the month, we incurred uh, direct labor in the mixing and packaging departments of $10,500 and $12,000, respectively. So total wages for the month, wages payable, $22,500. So we would debit, work in process, mixing, debit, work in process, packaging, credit, wages payable. On transaction D, we recognize the equipment depreciation for mixing and packaging departments of 30 3350 and 1000 respectively. So debit, factory overhead mixing, debit, factory overhead packaging, credit, wages payable. Actually, it'd be depreciation expense. I don't know why it says wages payable. That's not correct. But you get the idea. Applied factory overhead. Uh, for each department, seventy thousand two hundred and fifty and thirty five hundred respectively. You debit work in process mixing, debit work in process packaging, credit factory overhead mixing, credit factory overhead packaging. Transaction F: We transferred cost of eighty six thousand four seventy five from the mix, mixing to packaging department. You debit work and process packaging and credit work and process mixing. That's how you that's how you represent a transfer uh, using a journal entry. We transfer goods one hundred six thousand out of the packaging department to finished goods. You debit finished goods credit work and process packaging. Then we're going to sell. We've got to sell, right? So record cost of goods sold from finished goods. 
You debit, costs of goods sold, and credit, finished goods. You guys know all that stuff. It's, it's the same as it was when you learned uh, how to do the adjusting entries. And this is a uh, flow. This is a cost flow. Kind of a nice visual representation of the flow of materials. Raw materials, uh, we, we debit purchases, credit the materials used. That goes to work in process. Just shows the flow of that work in process. We add our materials and factory overhead and labor. And we transfer it out, transfer it into the next department. We transfer that out and we transfer it to finished goods. It's a nice visual flow of, of the cost. A journal entry for the process cost system. Uh, so what does it all look like? Materials, 68,875. 68, 6, 6, Work in process mixing department, 3,525. Work in process packaging department, 7,725. Finished goods, 4,000. Giving us total inventories of 22,125. Our company reports that the mixing department uh, shows beginning inventory 6,225. The July inventory process 6,225 consists of uh, direct materials and conversion costs. 5,000 direct materials, 1,225 conversion costs. Bring us total inventory and process 6,225. So remember, it's always going to be direct materials plus conversion costs equals inventory. Direct materials plus conversion costs equals inventory. We talked, we talked about this earlier. Uh, direct, direct materials cost per equivalent. Remember, it's direct materials cost for the materials uh, for the period divided by uh, units, the equivalent units of direct materials. In this example, 5,000 divided by 5 gallons is a dollar per gallon. Equivalent costs of unit production. We take the total conversion cost divided by the equivalent units of conversion cost. 1,225 divided by 5,000 times 70. Remember that the uh, 70 was the units, 70% were the units completed at the beginning, 5,000, 35 cents. And this, it's basically the same example that we showed you earlier, just using different figures. That's what it looks like on the uh, report. On the report. <clears throat> okay, this is the this is the end. But I want to show you uh, this last important concept. We call this yield. Yield. Uh, the word yield stems from uh, what is produced, right? Uh, the output. The yield. It's the yield. How do we figure out what is yield? We take the quantity of the material output divided by the quantity of the material input. That gets you yield. Your yield. What is the growth? That's what yield. Growth is yield. Materials, uh, materials output divided by materials input. That's yield. Here's an example. We assume that 1,000 pounds of sugar enter our packaging department and 980 pounds of sugar were packed. So we used output 980 divided by total input 1,000. Our yield is 98%. That's how you com compute yield. Yield. Very easy concept. but So it's important to know what, uh, what your yield is, how much you're using. That's what yield. Okay, we made it to the end. Yay! <laughs> and look at that. We're even on time. We're, we're ahead of time. That's incredible. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> Are there any questions that any of you have uh, in regard to process cost? which was chapter 17. Any questions at all? No? 
No, it it seems a lot similar no. to uh, to the last chapter. Yeah, exactly, Josh. It's very very similar to the to the last chapter. Um, and again, the, the primary difference between job cost and process cost is in job cost, we're we're basically creating things in batches based off of a sales order. And in process cost, it's a continuous process. It's it's always continuous. It's like it's like a uh, ice cream manufacturer. They work twenty four hours a day, seven days a week on an assembly line. Yeah. That's really the primary difference between the two. But the concepts are the same. Concepts are the same. Yeah, very good. Question. Yeah, go ahead, Tamika. Are you using a different book than what is on Cengage? Because I noticed when you started your slides, the the um, first um, page was different from what's... It's slightly different, yeah. So, Tamika, this... Uh, the, these, the slides that we're using are the 13th edition, or, I'm sorry, the 15th edition, and, and the book we're using is the 14th, but it's all the same material. It's just it's just slightly updated, but you'll you'll notice that, uh, to, especially toward the end of our course, you'll, you'll notice that it goes up to like chapter 28. The book only goes to 26. The reason for that is the last uh, few chapters are spread out a little bit further just to make it uh, a little easier. Oh. Good question. Yeah, it's the same though. It, uh, the 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 fourteenth edition and fifteenth edition. It's the same exact stuff. It's ju it's just it might be uh, the examples might be slightly different, and maybe the positioning might be slightly different. But it's the same exactly. exact content. I actually have the the actual book as well from when I was in um, Professor Chatler's class. Uh huh. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I. The other book, and then the book that I have is the same, which shows on the um, Cengage. And then I know right. like yours had something different. Okay. Yeah, it's the same. It's just it's just this is the uh, the fifteenth edition slides for the fourteenth edition book. The reason why I did that is because I I, I think that the fifteenth edition slides kind of they give uh, the examples a little bit more clear than they were in the fourteenth edition. But well, it's all the same exact information. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I pr appreciate the question. Are there any other comments, questions, concerns before we call it a night? Uh, yes. Professor, will this be okay. leading to uh, activity-based costing? Yeah. Uh, that's coming up. I, I want to say it's the next chapter. That sounds right. Um, yeah, I think it's the next chapter is activity-based costing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a fun concept. I, I like activity-based costing because we'll we'll talk about how we you how we allocate costs based off of activities. Uh, activities would be like, um, let's say we're making a piece of furniture. The activity uh, on activity would be upholstery for that furniture. Uh, another activity would be staining the furniture. Um, for to complete the furniture activities, right? But yeah, we'll talk more about that. But yeah, okay. we're getting there. How different is it from like selling? From selling? Uh, what do you mean? Like allocating costs to sell. Oh sure. Uh, so when we get to that part, and we'll all actually get to that part right after activity-based costing. But w what we do is. Uh, we take, of course, all of the costs associated with manufacturing a finished good, and we add in selling and administrative expenses. And the selling and administrative expenses are the costs associated with selling the finished good. So it's basically like saying the finished good plus selling administrative expenses, and that is the, the cost of selling, if you will. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Give me something to think about uh, for along the week. Cool. Sounds good. <laughs> Very cool. Any other comments, questions, concerns, anything I can help you with? And and um, actually, since I have almost all of you in the room, um, question for you all. Do you find uh, – is there anything that you would like to see change? With the way that I lecture or the way uh, maybe the pace, um, I'm just trying to get some feedback from you all just because 
your feedback helps me as a professor to better understand your needs, right? And and I, what I'll do is um, I'll send out a, a an anonymous survey um, near the midterm, and that anonymous survey will really help me to to better understand uh, or to adjust my approach to teaching, because I, I I always find that. Um, Sometimes maybe I go too fast or maybe I, I don't use enough examples or, or whatever it is. And so your feedback will actually help me because what I'll do is I'll use your feedback to to adjust, right? And uh, that's that's the way I prefer to teach is uh, I take your feedback seriously. And I want you to know that. And I want it I want to be able to demonstrate that I take your feedback seriously. So if you have any recommendations to my teaching, like use more examples, go a little slower, um, you know, or, or, or whatever you feel, it'll really help me. Yeah. Um, be honest with you, um, Professor Keisha, how are you today? Hey, good. How are you? I'm good. Um, so far from me being at UDC, um, since 2018, you're probably one of the only professors that actually offer help. And then the fact that you record the class so we can review later on, that really helps. So from being at from being at different professors, you're probably the only one that have an open door policy because some are not all that open door and some really don't respond back. So the fact that you do respond back, you do record the lessons um, so far. I, to me, I think you're doing pretty good. It is a lot of information. I mean, accounting is just what it is. Right. But you do offer more assistance than a lot of the professors that I have had so far. Great. I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate knowing that. And, uh, and again, my, my goal is to make sure that you all, uh, uh, I don't, you're not going to become experts in the accounting. I mean, I'm, maybe some of you might, right. But the, the idea is not for you to walk off and be uh, an accountant. Right. That's not the idea. The idea is that you understand the principles and you know how to apply them. Uh, and you're not gonna, you're not going to remember everything, right? Uh, the idea is that my job is to help you to learn, to help you to apply what you learn, and to make things easier for you. Because I know, you know, I remember what being a student was like and having multiple classes and having to go through all of this crazy stuff with assignments and this and that. And uh, I want to make sure that you're getting the most out of this experience. And that's why I ask those types of questions, because I want you to be able to have that high quality experience that you're looking for. I mean, although we're virtual, it's still it's still important that you get everything you can out of this experience. And uh, that's my goal. I want to make sure that I help you with that process. So, great. Okay, anything else? We're okay. Yeah, I would like to say just hello, everyone. I didn't great. introduce myself the, the first day because I wasn't here. I wasn't that's doing, right. doing I was, I was doing something, but and then we had Martin Luther King um, holiday. Right. So I just yeah. want to say hello to everyone. Hi, Professor. Hi. And then definitely keep pace with the pace. Miss Boss, can can you tell us a, uh, just real quickly? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, uh, what you prefer to be called? What your major is? What you hope to get out of the class? Okay, so okay, uh, my name is Jean Viel Smalls. My major is my major. I'm majoring in hospitality and tourism. Um, this is my last year, my last semester at um the community college. So I will Great. be transferring and getting my bachelor's degree. Um, Wonderful. What I can get out of this class is, I would say, is, um, well, I'm in hospitality hospitality and tourism management. Right. So when, when we're going over modular accounting, that's something that I'm going to use. For I'm sure. definitely going to use in my, because it's really close to cost control. That's right. Um, and from what I have learned in last, um, well, no, I took, Accounting two probably, I dreaded it. I mean, accounting one, <laughs> accounting one probably like I want to say two thousand and nineteen. So it's been a minute. 
Okay. It's been a minute, right. But your videos and YouTube videos has really been um, helping. Great. And the lectures also. So I have to, I'm that student that have to put everything together to got understand you. it. Like, I got so you. That, that's me. Um, I mean, I prefer, you call me Miss Smalls. Um, a lot fine. of people, okay. a lot of people don't uh, get my first name right, but John whatever Vio. is fine. John Vio. John Vio. John Vio, yes. And it's French, but I'm not French. <laughs> got you. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Miss Smalls. I appreciate you, and I, I appreciate that warm introduction. And I'm looking thank forward you. to working with you throughout the semester. Me too. Cool. Okay. Any other comments, questions, or concerns before we call it a night? All good? Well, I, I put in the um, <laughs> I was trying to figure out what was the name of the YouTube channel. Oh yeah, uh, I will. Um, uh, I will send uh, when when I when I send out this recording, I'll also put in the announcement. I'll I'll give the link to the channel, which is where I post all of these videos. It's it's a closed network, so it's not like you know your names aren't going to be out in the public public, right? It's only for the students. So um, uh, I'll provide you with that with that link. In the in the announcement. Good question. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Well, if if there's nothing else, uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Um, please stay safe. Wash your hands. Do all the right things. <laughs> and uh, and if you ever need anything, whatever it is, you just let me know. Okay. You email me. You call me. Set up office hours with me. I'll be happy to go over any concepts you'd, that you want to help to better understand. And um, I'm here for you. Okay? So thank you all. Thank you, Professor. And thank have you. A pleasure. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Take thank you. care. Have, have a, a great night. night. Thank you all have so much. Good night, everybody. Thank bye, you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.